Hello and welcome to Running Your Stories. We have a great episode here for you today. We're going to have Gav Dodd on, who has just run in the Manchester Marathon, put in a superb time. And I was chatting with, with Gav a few months ago about his training and I think his whole training program, his attitude toward it, uh, are definitely worth listening to. If you're interested in training intelligently, getting faster, and having longer longevity in your running, this is a good episode for you. I'm joined again by my son William here on the introduction. How are you doing, William? Fine. Fine. And you were down a track with me again this week, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Do you like running around the track? Yeah. Yeah. And what was your what was your favourite part about the warm ups that we were doing this time? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know the Just warm-ups. everything. Everything. So you like coming down, meeting a few people, yeah. doing a bit of running. Yeah. Did you like it with your sister there to play with as well? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we got a nice picture of us that we put out on Instagram and oh, Facebook, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. Of me and you and Eleanor running together. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, let's get on with the uh, with the chat with Gav. And uh, William and I will be back in a moment uh, after the interview just to say thank you and goodbye. So let's get on with the show. So, welcome Gav to Running Your Stories. Thank you. <laughs> Pleased to be here. I've been, uh, been looking forward to speaking with you since um, I think it was the Sin and Lions Christmas Carol run where we were having a chat. Yeah, it's been like a while ago now. Yeah, it was, it was a while ago. Spring already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and the, the, the thing that, that caught my attention then was the fact that you were training um, what I would call properly, sort of intelligently. Um, and I was doing the same at the time. Um, we were comparing notes and that's I think that's really where our conversation started yeah yeah um so yeah my focus I think at the time was the Manchester Marathon in 2019 which has obviously just passed um I I'll start from the beginning about I I did the Manchester Marathon in 2018 um and I had a good training block leading up towards that marathon um a couple of weeks before I had a few personal issues um, marriage issues and um sapped all my emotional energy I guess and and um, I, I was stood on the start line I didn't want to do it I didn't have the energy to do it and I actually ended up dropping out at about 16 miles I think um, and I guess that was the, the the start of this journey you know soon after that you know myself and my wife split up um, and I could have gone two ways you know I could have I could have stayed at home got depressed um, at pizza and you know done nothing and I, I chose the other way. I chose to sort of throw myself into my running. Um, you know, all of a sudden I had a bit more time on my hands, um, and I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to fill that with with, um, with running. I want to be the best runner I can be. Um, I'd run for quite a long time. I, you know, I ran at school. Um, had a good period of time after school where I didn't run so much. I went out with my friends, etc., and probably found running again in my thirties. Um, and I joined Stanley Lions. Don't know exactly when, but you know, probably about fifteen years ago, or whatever. Um, had some ups and downs. Never trained seriously, just sort of socially. Did all right. Got some PBs. Um, but this was the first time back in the end of two thousand eighteen where I thought, right, I'm going, I'm going to do everything right, and I'm going to really, really try and and get the best marathon time I possibly can. Um, coincidentally, at that time, I saw an advert on social media for. Uh, personalised coaching from a, a guy called Andy Vernon who some of your listeners may or may not know he's a he's an Olympic athlete he's a 10,000 metre runner he's you know he's beat Mo Farah a number of times across country so he's you know he's up there as one of the top five 10,000 metre runners in Britain um, and he was offering personalised coaching for a, what I think is a very reasonable weekly fee um, so I got in touch with him um, told him my goals um, and when we started working together, um, I think the plan initially was that we would do a pre-marathon training plan. So this was August 2018. And he said, you know, we'll, we'll try and get you in the best 10K shape we can for Christmas so that you enter your actual marathon training as fast as you can be, you know, in the best shape you've ever been in. Um, and you've already got that speed then. So when we start adding the layers of mileage on, etc., then... Um, you're in, you know, you're a good place. Um, so when he first started coaching me, I think I was probably running 25 miles a week maximum. Um, 
I might do a little bit of speed here and then. I'd done track sessions and hill sessions before with Stainland and Lions, and, and they were very good. But my life was had changed. I couldn't commit to Monday and Wednesday nights, so I had to, I had to try and change my training to, to suit my my life, my personal life. And that would be quite a lot of dinner time training, um, which I've got a reasonably flexible job, so I can do that. And training on the nights when I didn't have my daughter. Um, I don't have my daughter on a Sunday, so I could always get a good long run running. Um, and I think one of the key benefits from working with Andy was that he could um, he could teach me how to train intelligently rather than think that I always had to beast myself and that, you know always run on ego. Um, I think I've been guilty in the past, as a lot of people are, of every run. I was trying to make it look good on Strava. Um, I was trying to trying to do that thing where you're always running fast, but you're never really running fast. Um, so he bought these training blocks in where my week would be two sessions. One would be a track session, something like six times a mile or eight times 800 or something like that. The other session would be a tempo session. So it'd be a few miles warm up and then six or seven miles at a decent pace. And that would build in length, up, getting close towards the marathon. And then a, a long, steady run on a Sunday um, and again, that started at about 12 miles, and then my, my normal steady run then became 15 miles on a Sunday, obviously building up in the months before the marathon. Um, and the other key thing that he introduced was lots and lots of slow running, sandwiching all these all these sessions. Um, again, his, his viewpoint was that the more miles you do, the stronger and fitter you'll become. Um, and, and, and you know, literally, if you ran twenty miles a week and you started running thirty consistently, or if you ran forty and started running fifty, that would help you. You would become a better runner from just running more miles. Obviously, as I said, the caveat being those have got to be steady, otherwise you'll get injured, um, and and you build those miles up slowly. Um, so I started doing that in August last year, um, and and there's no sort of there's no magic to it. There's no sort of special scientific formula to it. it literally just a lot of steady consistent training you know built up from 25 to 30 to 40 to 50 and you know getting towards November and December I was doing 50 miles a week consistently and that become my norm and you know I can remember a time where that would be alien to me you know the distance used to scare me but I was loving it I was loving I was loving feeling strong feeling fast um, and I did a couple of races um, Travellers 6 and Percy Pud um, I think they were both in December um, and absolutely smashed my, my previous times that I'd done a few years earlier on both those races so you know, I was worried for a while thinking is this going to work but it gave me so much belief that, that that process was working and I was becoming a sort of stronger uh, faster runner um, did a couple of runs over Christmas 5k at um, Halifax Park on Christmas, uh, Boxing Day sorry Christmas Day and um New Year's Day run from Barkisland Cricket Club in Halifax and, and both those were you know again I smashed my previous times so I, I think that's when people started to, to notice that, that Gav was getting a bit faster here and um, you know that a change a change in me really yeah so w one of the things that I, I wanted to pick up on there was because um, I'm also a big believer and have seen success from this some people call it running slow to run fast um, how how slow is slow? Are you, are you doing this by pace, by heart rate? How, how are you doing it? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the time is personal for everyone. So for me, for me, my 5K pace might have been 6.20, 6.25. I was probably running like 19.45, 5Ks. So my slow running um, could have been as slow as 9.30s. Mm. Um, and again, this is this is relevant to anyone that runs, you know. This, but they're just my times. But my slow running was really, really slow. Um, but my fast running was really, really fast. So I, you know, I might have been doing a session on Tuesday. You know, sometimes it was getting up to six, seven, eight times a mile on the track. And Andy was always a big fan of a big warm up and a big warm down. So the, there, was, there was times when it was ten or twelve miles on the track on a Tuesday, real tough session. But that meant that all I could do the day after was a painfully slow six or seven miles, um, and I, I think when I got into that routine, he was always a big fan of not many rest days as well, one rest day every fortnight perhaps. Right. Um, but it was a slow build up to that. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, so so the slow days were painfully slow, but um, what they allowed me to do was recover from the Tuesday session and and prepare my body um, for the Friday session or Thursday session or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, because that's that's it's what I've been sort of trying to learn and you know looking at different sources of information um, because it's so hilly around here. I, yeah, I, I tend to rather than working on pace, work off heart rate. Yeah, understand. because if I'm going up a really steep hill, um, it's a much slower pace. Yeah, yeah. And I work in kilometres uh, rather <laughs> than miles, so <laughs> I kind of use the things even more. But again, I mean, I, I guess if you, if you're talking, if we were saying on the flat, you were maybe yeah. doing like a nine and a half minute mile or something. Like yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Because so, a, lot, a lot of my running was on the canal. I'd, I live, yes. uh, sorry, work in Copley, Halifax, which is so dinner time runs canal. Yeah. So, oh, and then and I've I've kind of tried this this out on on this that same canal actually, with, with keeping a, a low heart rate. Um, I'm I'm probably running as fast as, uh, fact, probably quicker than eight minute miles, and that my heart rate's staying really low. Yeah. yeah. But if I hit a hill. I could be hitting 12, 13 minute miles. Right, okay. Going uphill yeah, yeah. to get the same heart rate. You know, it's, I, I was shocked at how big a difference it makes because, I mean, it's, it is seriously hilly around here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which, yeah. which is why I kind of felt I, I needed to learn that, that lesson myself. Um, so, yeah, that's so why I was interested in, in how you, you're setting it now. Of course, if, like you say, if you're running on relatively flat ground, Pearson, I think, is absolutely yeah, solid. Yeah. And I, <laughs> He would put some decent hill sessions in, you know, like sort of six times three minutes on a decent hill. Um, like you said, there's a lot of decent hills around here, but <laughs> yeah. but my hill running as well, um, I, I was just floating up hills um, on the back of it. Um, so, you know, I think that just that strength and, and um, time on feet just, just sort of was making me such a strong athlete, really, on the back of, uh, back of all that training. Yeah. Did it, did it make a, a difference to your, your body weight? Um, I think I'd, yeah. Initially, I dropped a few pounds, um, but then I've sort of stagnated. Um, yeah. So um, I think I was about getting on for eleven stone when I started all this. I'm probably I'm probably steady sort of five. Sorry, ten six now, something like yeah. that. I just seem to stay at that now. Really, um, I eat plenty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I I, th I think that was just a bit of I don't know. A bit of a change just due to the, the increase in mileage really yeah um but I'm, I'm strong you know i do i do sort of weights and i try and keep myself as strong as i can because one thing that did happen initially when i upped the mileage was i was getting a little bit of low, lower back ache or pain mm -hmm. um so i started doing some strength exercises there and i think that was just because my legs and my arms and my upper body were getting stronger um and my, my core probably needed to to go with it a little bit really so uh, yes yeah, so you, you're doing um, strength and core sessions? Yeah, yeah, I just do, I've got a few weights at home and uh, sort of a, a sit-ups bench, so I do some sort of sit-ups, back back exercises, and just a bit of biceps and a prior row and things like that. Not massive, but... Um, yeah, yeah. which, which again, I, I find um, my best training, um, again, and injury prevention. Yeah. Um, best way is, is keeping strong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've I've been going for a bit more on the strength side because some of the races I do we carry in a pack. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which which is how I managed to hurt myself. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> With probably my most serious recent training injury was uh, was due to putting the pack on when I wasn't used to it. <laughs> I've I've done some uh, long runs on the canal with a very light innovate pack and um, on wet days that was you know, some of the rubbing and chaffing I got from that was uh, yeah, yeah pretty it, bad. So I don't know how you do it with a decent pack on. Yeah, it's yeah, you get used to it. It's yeah. like everything else. You, you you train for the the way you're going to race um, and work work out these these details. Because um, yeah, that's I guess in some ways the nice thing about doing marathons and actually the the reason why I enter some marathons to use them as training runs is because you've got aid stations. Yeah, exactly. So you don't have to carry everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, last last Sunday I did do a twenty six and a half mile training run, right? And uh, that meant my pack was stuffed full to have <laughs> enough, uh, you know, food and water with me because there's the no aid stations when yeah, you go running yeah. on your run. <laughs> That's an, an interesting point, actually. Something I should probably mention. Um, Andy was a massive advocate of doing most of my training runs fasted, so 
most of my long runs, other than a couple of trial speed long runs, were, were all done fasted, just a drink of water before I went out of the door at sort of 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. And I'd be doing 18, 20 miles with, with nothing in me at all. Um, and that seemed to work really well. And, you know, I actually only had three gels on the whole of the proper marathon. Um, and I, again, the idea with that was that your body would get used to not having the fuel. I think, I think it, the way you described it was sometimes when you, you're giving yourself or your body all these gels and stuff, it's like putting tinder on a fire that's going to burn really quickly. And what you need to do is get your body used to putting logs on the fire that are going to burn for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was able to do 20 miles slow on the canal dead easy without any fuel. Um, obviously when I ran faster, um, I did take a few gels then because you, you sort of, you naturally burning more energy. But, um, but I'm now a big believer in that, that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the companies that make these gels and energy drinks and stuff like that are, uh, are really over-egging the amount of things you need to get through uh, well, marathons. I, I, I think there's, um, and, and again, it's something I'm very interested in and been reading up on. Um, as I understand it, there's broadly speaking three ways of, the, well, there's, there's four ways of doing it. One one way is just you just go and run and you don't pay any attention to anything. Yeah. That's obviously, that's A way. <laughs> don't recommend it. Um, the other one, which a lot of people have success with and good on them, like you say, is to, to buy all, all the fancy gels and um, Tailwind and, you know, everything else and, and they just put a lot of stuff very scientifically put together stuff down their necks all the way through and they get some good results. Yeah. And, and again, good on them. What you're describing there is, again, very similar to what I've been doing. Um, I've come at it slightly differently, um, but actually it's it's, it. it's it's exactly the same principles. The idea being that when you're fasted and you run, your body has to, it's forced to um, burn body fat because you haven't got the carbs in, in your system. Yeah. And so then when you take the gel or whatever in the race, you've suddenly got this extra... It's. I, I feel like I'm turbocharged. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when yeah. I take that stuff, then in a race, um, and and you you just get faster, it gets easier. Yeah. And one of the really useful things about that is that, yeah, um, the amount of energy you burn when you're running, especially when you're running fast, is more than you can digest. Yeah. Because um, you, you can digest about a gram of carbohydrates a minute, um, and you're burning more energy than that. Yeah. <laughs> so. The, the more you can switch your body over to being fat adapted the and used to burning fat then the less you need to consume exactly as you found yeah yeah because um, then the, the the other way is rather than switching to body fat of course some people have, uh, are switching over to burning protein on keto diets and things yeah yeah um, now the medical professionals that I know um, don't like the sound of that at all but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I think you know there's those different kind of schools of thought like you say some people are into yeah I'll, I need a gel every 15 minutes I need to drink this I need to drink that Yeah. and for me it sounds very very complicated um, I've done um, 30 mile runs like you say getting out of bed have a drink of water and mm. just carry I mean I, I always carry food and water yeah, with definitely. me I always, I always took something distance. just in case just in yeah. case but yeah I'm the emergency fiver <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> but yeah go out and do a 30 mile run fasted now I wouldn't try to do that fast because the faster you get, the more you're getting into your carb burning zone. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, the idea is to keep moving that carb burning zone further and further out by getting fat adapted. Um, and so yeah, I'm, I think that's a, it's a, it is a really key part of the training. I think it also reduces your 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 likelihood of tummy trouble as well. You know, you're not taking yes. on board stuff that might mess with your stomach or anything like that, which you easily can on it. You know, I've seen people have like five minute breaks in toilets on long runs and marathons um, yeah. well if you move into the ultra world um, yeah. <laughs> 80% of people throw up before the end of the ultra yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's for exactly that reason <laughs> I got, some other bits of advice I got was that um, you don't always need to drink the energy drinks you know your, your brain's very clever and just like if you drink diet coke your brain gets a message thinking it's sugar it's the same with the energy drinks you know sometimes it's enough to swill an energy drink round in your mouth spit it out and you get that signal to your brain saying, oh, he's, he's taken on board something here. I'm all right. I feel better. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was something, again, that I tried in the marathon. I didn't I didn't drink the energy drink. I just swilled it around in my mouth and That's didn't have any sugar before the race. Because, um, again, I was told that if you have sugar just before the race, 
it sends a message to your brain saying you're overfueled and you've got loads of stores and obviously you haven't you might just had a I don't know a bit of chocolate or gel or something so I was told not to take any sugar before the race mm. um, and again that seemed to work as well yeah that, that's uh, that's really interesting because um, one of the races while I was learning these things and like I say for some reason I I, I kind of decided to um, to learn them the hard way <laughs> um, it was um, I, I was trying to move away from sort of artificial sugars and move on to fruit and things like that yeah, yeah. but again for some reason I decided to eat a load of fruit just before a race yeah and right at the start of the race there was a big hill so you know if you're in a race and you're going up a hill you tend to go as fast as you can without killing yourself yeah by the time I got to the top of that hill I was already bonking yeah, yeah. And, and I never really got the feeling back I, 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 I hit flow a little bit on on some of the the almost flat sections um, but every time I hit a hill for the rest of the and it, this was a 22 mile race yeah, yeah every time I hit a hill I just I couldn't get my body back to kind of feeling normal yeah yeah um, and, and actually that's sounds like that's exactly what I did wrong was having that little little input of sugar just yeah. before the race yeah yeah e- even though it was very natural sugar it's still the same thing yeah that's going to do to you um, the, the other things that were mentioned aren't there you know i'm not i'm not professing to be any kind of expert but the other things i learned um was that the, the week before the marathon is probably more important than the day before so um in terms of sleep fuel and hydration so i was taking yeah. um a water bottle to work every day the week up to the marathon with um with electrolytes in just to keep that topped up and i was eating well every day you know not crazy you know you you know, again you're told you need to have massive pasta meals the night before and you don't you know a little bit more it's fine but just just eat well the week up to it sleep well the week up to it and keep well hydrated and then actually the night before if you have a rubbish sleep you're still probably going to be all right because that you know you, you've built that consistent sleep up through the week yeah. before um yeah yeah again I th- i've heard that from, from a few people and i think it's it's really sound advice that you can't predict what's going to happen the night the night before the race yeah you know, sometimes you know, you're, i wasn't sometimes you're in a hotel or whatever right? yeah you, know, you can't always control yeah. all those control but, but the, the the nights before that try and control those yeah more. and uh, yeah yeah because it makes a huge difference whether you're feeling tired or not yeah 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 <laughs> although the interesting the sleep research says that if you get up in the morning if you convince yourself you've had a good night's sleep your body will perform like you have so there, there, there's another little one too yeah. to put in your back pocket if you have had a bad night's sleep that's so, so much of it's mental isn't it it like, is yeah. I, I, I did um, put that to the test a little bit on the spine where I tried to have a 15 minute sleep right. and I didn't actually manage to get to sleep at all but uh, sort of when day breaks you, you start feeling better anyway yeah, yeah. so when day broke I did manage to convince myself well you had some sleep in the night so you must be feeling good now Yeah, yeah. and I, I did I felt doubly good <laughs> Because I just convinced myself somehow <laughs> that, that I'd uh, that I'd had some sleep, and, and my body started acting like I had. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know where we got to with that, but I was so so that was I covered last year's marathon, didn't? I? And then yes. I guess the training into this one. Um, so I knew I'd trained really really well, and I, I I got into sort of January, and I did a couple of half marathons, and I'd never broke one thirty for a half before. Um, so I did in skip in early January with a couple of other guys from Stainland, um, and I, yeah, I set off at six fifty pace, um, and I, I felt like I could probably go faster than that. But Andy had said, "Look, just nail your sub one thirty, and then we can move on next time." And I did, you know, sort of felt really comfortable, and I think I got one twenty nine twenty or something like that, um, which was another massive tick in the box. I'd never been that fast before, and again, mm-hmm. I think I think that sort of cemented what I've been doing and, and actually made a few other few people more interested you know cause again they've been saying you're going too slow and they're actually seeing some decent results from my training you know that was a three and a half minute PB um, three and a half minute all time PB but actually in the, the few months I've been working with Andy I think I dropped down to like a 140 half marathon runner mm. so I'd probably improved 10 minutes in three or four months um, mm. on the half marathon and you know I'd really sort of dragged myself back to better than my previous best ever um, did another half on Alton Park motorbike circuit, which was a surprisingly hilly course, um, and I got one thirty in nine seconds, which 
it's probably better than the Inskip race really because it was such an undulating course and a horrible day as well so um, so yeah well, I was getting more and more confident and um, the process was working I was doing my long runs um, on the canal on a Sunday and you know 15 was then a short, a short run for me I was doing 15s 18s 20s loads of them um, and it was only as we were starting to get closer to the marathon that I started getting nervous again and uh, it was a mental thing I, I knew physically I was in good shape but because I'd been able to walk off the course last year there's a big fear factor in my head. Um, part of me was scared that I knew I had the mental capability to walk off when the going got tough. Um, and I knew that I'd made myself accountable with this, this whole marathon journey. I'd, I'd put it on Instagram and I'd done a, a, a picture every day from my, all my training, you know, sort of put the date on there, what I'd done, some little notes about it, and told the world I was going to try and train hard for a marathon. And this marathon was coming up, and I was like, "Oh bloody hell, <laughs> I've got to do it now." Um, but I had faith, you know. I, I kept going, and the, I remember the night before, I was scared to death in the morning of it, scared to death. And I think I'd agreed that I'd set off about seven ten pace. Um, myself and Andy thought I was capable of like a three ten marathon, um, and physically, I think I was. But in hindsight, mentally, I think I was probably capable of a three twenty because I knew there was going to be a hard some hard part in that marathon where I had to really dig deep and work hard and um, I think the key was that I got a solid time and completed the marathon and used it as a building block for some more marathons down the line you know I, I, I do think I'm capable now of 310 I, I want to see if I can get a, a sub 3 um, in my lifetime and I think you know I've only done 8 months of this training I think with another couple of years of it, I think I'm going to get better and better and faster and faster and hopefully don't get injured and, and keep on that journey. Yep. Um, but um, on this one, 710s, about 13, 14 miles turned into 730s. As predicted, I had that sort of tough mental spot around 16 miles where I walked off the year before. Um, and I, th I think... I had to draw on all my mental reserves. I had to play games in my head and get to 16 and tell myself, right, do everything you can to get to 20. And at 20, you can start reevaluating. Um, so I did. I got to 20. I'm sure everyone has these same blockers where you're thinking, God, can I really finish this? And at 20, it was right. I was starting to imagine how fast six miles was and, you know, trying to position it as a run around Halifax in my head and, you know, you can do six miles. Got to 23. I just had a park run to do. Um, and at 23, I knew then that if I did something like nine minute miles, I could get around in sub 320. And that, you know, I knew that was a solid time. My previous PB had been 327, so that would be respectable and that, I would be happy with that. And I managed to find a little bit more than that and finish in, um, I think I finished in 317.50 was my chip time. Um, and going over the line, there was just a massive sense of relief. I saw some Stainland supporters in the last half mile, and it was brilliant to see them. and you know, just the relief of finishing and getting that solid time, um, yeah, it was just amazing. Um, and I'd, I'd enjoyed all the journey. Um, I probably enjoyed all the journey more than I enjoyed the race. You know, I really enjoyed doing all the marathon training. Um, and in hindsight, I've, I've, you know, I did enjoy the race, but there were some scary, nervous times. Um, but yeah, it's done now, and I, 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 I'm looking forward to sort of trying to beat some PBs at other distances now for the rest of the year and, and probably start this journey again in uh, August 2019 for another spring marathon next year. Well, I think, first of all, um, big congratulations on the, on the result. Thank you. That's, that's what you've been, been working for. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I, I guess the the first thing to, to sort of pick up and, and talk about a bit further there is um, a point that I know... It's been talked about on some of my uh, favorite podcasts that I listen to, and and that's the point about enjoying the training. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the the training and the journey to get you to the race. If if you're not enjoying that, you're probably doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because um, again, as uh, a nice quote I saw recently was, uh, when you do a marathon or, or whatever race you do, and that's your victory lap. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You, you've done all the hard work before it. And yeah. uh, you know the, the the race itself is is kind of like a victory lap from from all the hard work you've you've put in. Yeah. And 
and all the the enjoyment along the way to get you there. So, and uh, there's, you know, I've, I've had to find. I, I have enjoyed it all, but sometimes, some days I was doing like double runs, and sometimes I had to go out on my own on a Monday night and get six easy miles done when I'd done a twenty mile on the Sunday. And I had to draw on lots of different things to motivate myself. So, I've done things like listening to audio books. I'm a big listener of podcasts, so um, I listen to podcasts when I'm running on my own. I made Thursday night with the fast group at Stainland a regular thing, so I was running with Ed and Leon and um, other guys, Tony, etc. And that was a, a really enjoyable run where we'd, we'd, we'd work hard as a team, and I think we've all got better for, from doing that. Um, my long runs, sometimes I'd run with guys from Stainland or, or elsewhere and might do like 10, 15 miles with them and some of it on my own, then a little bit faster or whatever. But just, um, I think the key was just mixing it up and making everything different and, and always having a reason to go for a run um, and of course you know you're not you're not going to always want to go out of the door there's times when you get home from work and you sit there and think oh I cannot be bothered but I can hand on heart say I never ever regretted any of the runs in the whole training plan um, and, and and just you know some, some of the some of the things that I enjoyed were getting home and putting a picture on Instagram or updating my run onto Strava or whatever those were like little rewards when I'd done it. Um, yeah, I mean, just, just to pick up on on that one that you mentioned there, um, because I, I've I've read in, in other places that it's a very big motivator, and and I've I've felt it myself. And that is like you say, sometimes you, you get home from work and it's raining and it's cold and it's horrible outside. Yeah, and you yeah. think I just really don't want to go out again. I'm I'm tired today, but you never get back from that run thinking i wish i hadn't done that yeah 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 you, 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 for me it's usually a um, couple of miles into it something will just click and i'll say i'm so pleased i forced myself out the door yeah exactly uh, and you like you say I, I i completely agree with you i've never regretted one of those runs yeah the, the, the harder it is to push yourself out the door the more you're pleased with yourself when you get back yeah and it's trying to again it's, a, it's this weird thing where you have to kind of trick yourself into certain things but also you got to just remind yourself that don't forget how good you're going to feel when you get back yeah when, when you're trying to get yourself out the door and actually my, my wife starts saying it to me now because I'll, I'll, I'll say oh. you know because it's, it's when you're taking 30 40 minutes to get your shoes on you know it's, procrastinating <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you just you kind of finding all kinds of excuses to prolong getting out the door and she'll say you always feel better when you get back yeah it's true I can't argue with that <laughs> I think with that that sort of easy hard training that 8% easy 20% hard as well um, that's mentally as well as physically so the track session the tempo and the long run you, you're a, I was more fearful of doing those than the rest of the week's running you know mm. I'd, sometimes you go to the track and it'd feel like a race or you know you're thinking god I've got to work hard here for 7 miles at tempo or I'm going to have to run 20 miles on a Sunday so because I was only having that stress of knowing that was going to be a hard run three times a week and the other three runs or four runs a week I could go out thinking it doesn't matter how slow I run today I wasn't draining myself mentally all the time yes. as well whereas historically every run I was almost draining myself mentally because I was trying to show off or beat a certain time or trying to look good on Strava so I, th I think you, the slow runs give you a mental and physical relaxation yes. um, and prepare you for the next hard session yeah, and, and actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good point because we, we, we talked briefly beforehand about the fact that um, obviously you, you decided to, to hire a coach. Um, I, I've been doing my training without a coach, which is why it's been interesting that we've got to the same, same basic principles yeah, yeah, behind yeah. the training. Um, but one of the things that really um, I find difficult sometimes is to make the decision about, right, is today's run a, f a fast run or a slow run? Um, and sometimes I then end up going in the middle, which is the. Yeah. It's not a complete waste of time, but it's not going to give you as much benefit as going either fast or slow. Um, and that, that's where I think I can certainly see the attraction if somebody's told you, go slow today. It must. It's almost like a big weight off your shoulders. Yeah. And it's giving you the confidence that you can go out, you can relax, you can enjoy yourself. And it is doing you good because yeah. it's it's a it's quite an alien concept, that isn't it? <laughs> it is, and you know, again, it's a treat to myself, and it, you know, it's not expensive in the scheme of things, but it's something I wanted to choose 
as part of my investment to in my running to do and um, you know some people think it's daft some people think it's a good idea but it's something I enjoy and I, I like having that chat on a Sunday and getting that spreadsheet through on a Sunday night saying this is what you've got to do in the week ahead and it's someone that's not you making intelligent decisions for you yes. so you're not you know you, you, you can trick your mind or you can you know you can sort of convince yourself you don't need to do as many miles or you don't need to work as hard or you or, or the other way around you can convince yourself to work harder than you need to so it's someone with sort of loads of really really sound technical and not physical knowledge about running you know they know this is he's a professional athlete that knows his job um and and he's passing that information down and there's not many other sports where you could call on someone you know it's like it's the equivalent of a premiership footballer or, or yeah, whatever it's, it's somebody at the top of the game top of the game yeah. and they're giving you advice for you know a reasonable amount of money and there's a lot of a lot of athletes do this now um so yeah i mean i've absolutely loved it and you know i, I love talking about running anyway so i get to talk about an international, to an international <laughs> athlete every sunday about running so it's fantastic yeah and it, he's on the same journey himself he's going and he's going to do london marathon this year that's his first marathon being a ten thousand five thousand and cross country runner for for many years mm -hmm. so um yeah good luck andy if you listen to this <laughs> yeah I, I think um actually I, I i came up with um an idea to how to ask yourself the question sometimes as well um and i actually came up with this when i was helping the kids with their homework because they were they were learning spellings right and you know i want them to write it out until the they know it and then we can test yeah but of course they start getting bored and getting a bit lazy and so I said, right, do you, so when you think you've written it enough, is that because you're confident? Yeah, yeah, I'm confident. Are you overconfident? You know, are you, yeah. are you just kind of showing off to yourself or are you being lazy? Which, which is it? And it, and that's that's the same kind of thing that I, I start asking myself when I'm trying to decide, is this a long one or do I need a long one? Do I need a short one? Yeah. yeah. Am I confident about that? Am I overconfident? You know, uh, an overconfident is where I would say, oh yeah, I, I can do another fast one today. You know, am I being overconfident? Have I have I done too many fast ones, um, or if I decide to do a, a slow run, am I am I being lazy? Yeah. Or am I confident that's the right thing to do? And I, I I've, that's it's something I've started using now. As I say, it just kind of popped into my head one day when I was helping the kids with their homework. It's like you know, are you confident, overconfident, or lazy? Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I mean, and it, again, this this whole thing depends on how seriously you want to take your running and some some people just want to go out and run and decide that morning or night what they want to do mm. and that's fine and you know again I'm a bit of a running geek and I, w I wanted to challenge myself to be the best I could and I know from other areas of my life and work and stuff that the more you put in the more you get out you know and even if I didn't have this coaching thing I now know that the best way to run is to sit down on a Sunday and plan your next week because otherwise things can get in the way you can start making decisions based on how you feel that second etc so uh, you know the logic logic says sit down when you're not running you're not tired you've got a full belly and you, you you're thinking straight and plan that week ahead of what you need to do and then try and stick to it you can't always stick to it you know i've had times when i've got called out from work in the middle of the night and i've had to change my days etc but um but the more you can stick to that plan and do that consistent week on week training the better uh, you're going to get I, I guess one of the things you, you can do as well which is because um, to, to be honest I, I'm really liking the sound of this because you know I, I plan my weeks but I'm not writing it down and, yeah. and actually I, I think you're offering some really good advice and I think I should write it down because one of the things I think you get from writing it down is that like you say you, you're going to call out from work I, I volunteer for Mountain Rescue I get yeah. called out with Mountain Rescue sometimes in the middle of the night so that will definitely change my running plan the yeah. next day but if you write down next to you know this was this uh, say it's Tuesday night Wednesday I'm changing this run because I got called out last night you look at that written down you think that's very reasonable yeah you know that's that's fine whereas if you write down I'm changing this run today because I'm feeling great you think well, what hold on yeah yeah <laughs> what what are you doing yeah. um, but I, th I think once you write it down you, you see it very differently to just having it in your head yeah because when you have it in your head you you, you can play games uh, i certainly do yeah play games with myself all, all the time and convince myself of things <laughs> the, the toughest ones the toughest runs of my week weren't the sessions and the track sessions the tempo the long runs the toughest runs were going for a, a six mile steady run on a monday tea time after work 
you know, in, in some ways it's very easy, but also it's a bit boring and you could start thinking, well, there's no point, I could miss that. But I didn't, I didn't, I, I got to the mindset where I, I didn't miss a session or a run unless there was a, a real reason. And, and again, because it was written down, I could do it. I could get home and tick it off and it was done and, and feel pleased I'd done it. And uh, I, I'm convinced that all those steady, slow recovery runs were as just as important as all the fast track sessions in, in sort of yeah. building the strength over, De over time. Yeah, because uh, again, it was interesting what you were saying earlier about only having like one rest day every couple of weeks. Um, that wasn't initially that I went, you know, yeah, took a month to get to yes, that stage. Obviously yeah, where you, yeah. yeah abs absolutely, completely agree building up to it. Because um, again, th things that I've been learning about is about active recovery. Yeah. And, you know, um, like you say, a, a slow six mile run, you're not actually stressing your body. Once you get to the yeah. the, the right standard, that actually becomes recovery rather than yeah, do, yeah. doing more damage. Because um, as, as I mentioned to you before we started, I've got a, um, a, a tendon issue in my ankle at the moment. And this morning I went and did, um, it was just over three miles, very slow. Um, on the road, I usually run on off road, but on the road to make sure I wasn't twisting and turning yeah, it, yeah. Um, and got back and did stretches and roller and went while the muscles were warm, and it's much better yeah. having done that. And then, um, other than that, and being on the football pitch with uh, with my youngest son this morning, I've had a very lazy day. Right. But I've had the the active sort of recovery of getting the blood flowing through the muscles and but without doing any more damage <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and, it, and it's it's a hard balance and again I, I think this is this is where you can gain from a coach yeah so, somebody with experience to, to give you the advice on that well yeah there was sometimes when initially i'd done something on uh, on a sunday like a 20 mile run or a a, a race or whatever and i'd be expecting a rest day the following day and you say oh no no six miles or eight miles steady today and i was like what but actually, you, you know, you're, you're damn right. It, 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 it's, it's, it's like running a car, isn't it? When you've done took it for a long journey, it, it don't want to stop. It don't want your body. Don't want to be still. It wants to. It's used to running. It wants to yes. run. And as long as it's slow and steady and and just turning yourself over, then um, it's preparing yourself for next time you're going hard or the next session or whatever. Um, yeah, cause yeah. It, yeah. So, so something related to that that I've I've started, kind of, it's it's kind of developing in in my mind and and it. it, it came from uh, a, f a friend of mine who sh she actually has a business doing like recovery massages and stuff okay um and we're we're planning still planning a podcast about um recovery from training and when we were in the planning session um uh, Sinead was talking about transitioning you know you, you, you transition from running to being stopped yeah all the different parts of your body, just because you've crossed the line or hit a time or got home or whatever, um, how do you, how do your feet and your leg muscles know that now is the time to stop? And so, mm. you know, you, you're kind of normal way in running is you'll maybe just walk around a bit, do some stretches and things like that. Um, but as you say, if you've done a long run on a Sunday and you do nothing on Monday, that's it, it's it's the it's it's the wider kind of picture yeah, of yeah. Uh, of transition. Of your body going from you know really high workload to nothing, and that's never really a good thing. Yeah, you, you, it's it's trying to kind of flow up and down rather than being off a cliff edge kind of. Yeah, yeah. Because then you're going to crash when you get to the bottom, um, and, and that's again so something I'm I'm learning and sort of picking this up from different places as yeah. being really trying transition things smoothly because that's, that's what warm-ups are about to transition up as well as transitioning down and, and uh, there are another few key things that Andy put in the plan you know track session I thought, you know, everything had a two mile warm-up at least you know so if I was doing eight times 800 on the track there'd be a two mile warm-up and two mile warm down um, and it builds your mileage up as well and even tapering into the marathon I was still doing sort of probably 30 miles a week um, I probably do like 70 miles in the week prior to the marathon itself on Sunday and then you know probably 30 mile week the week before and there's still sessions in there they weren't quite as long and quite as intense but still sessions yeah. in there and and the day before a race so the day before the marathon the Saturday I think I did two miles with strides which again you know my personal way of training previously would have been rest day Friday and Saturday but 
I liked that. I liked getting my body moving the day before. You know, yes. it's slow, and then the strides are obviously a decent pace. But mentally and physically, it it, it, it made me feel ready. It made me feel professional. It made me feel, mm. put me in the right mindset. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, well, one of the things I've found, because uh, I'm, I'm also becoming a, a believer, having tried it both ways, of having a run the day before, um, usually only about three miles, yeah, yeah. Um, so something quite short. But what I find is that when I've tapered, I, I, I can start to lose my appetite completely. Yeah. And if I do that little run the day before, if nothing else, it gets my appetite back. Yeah, which yeah. means I eat properly the day before, which is really important. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. that in itself is useful. <laughs> and all these, all these things that professionals do that we can copy, they're doing them for a reason, and they're, they're doing them because of years and years of people teaching them or research or whatever. So I think, I think, attention to detail is is so important. Even if it just all it does is put you in the right frame of mind, um, and and you know helps you feel ready. Um, I had a, a a pair of r racing shoes that I wore and my training shoes and I liked it on a race day just to be able to put those a little bit cleaner, nicer, lighter shoes on. Um, again, that was something that helped and just got me in the, the right frame of mind mm. and made me feel in race mode as opposed to training mode, which was you know another little thing that helped me as well. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can get away with that when you're running on roads. Yeah, no, not so much <laughs> off-road, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I've just got four or five different pairs of trail shoes, depending on <laughs> what kind of <laughs> off-road it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's, uh, it's it's good. As, as I say, um, I, I've been very interested to, to talk to you and, and go through this kind of detail about the um, the training intelligently, because I, I I see and I know and I, I know from my own results um, how important it is it's like you were saying about um, doing um, fasted runs um, for the, the fell race I did a couple of weeks ago we did, the week before we did a, a recce of it so I did the recce fasted was that the awful weather day was it? yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah I, I was fasted that day and I, I was struggling to keep up with the group I was I wasn't the absolute slowest, and I, so I was offering to to hang back with with the guy who was a bit slower at the back. And said, right. oh, that's fine. I'll, I'll look after him because I knew I could I could keep going for the distance at that pace. Yeah. I, I was struggling to pick the pace up, and then on on race day, I just carried a bottle of Tailwind and drank that all the way around. Right. And then, <laughs> and then, and then beat most of the people I was on the recce with. <laughs> That's it, but that's that's preparation, isn't it? And but that's it, you know, it that's, that's not losing your ego on on warm ups or training runs. Yeah, it's and, it, and it's keeping it. In it it's, it's getting check. that difference between what's training and what's racing. Mm. Um, I I've, I find it very important because um, I push myself very hard when I'm racing, um, and I I sometimes scare myself how hard I'm willing to push myself yeah. for racing, and if I push myself that hard all the time, I would just hurt myself. Uh, you know, and mm. I'd be continually injured and I wouldn't get anywhere which I know some people unfortunately do that and get into that kind of mindset yeah and I, you know I, I'm in this for the long game now. I want to I want to build PBs and get better and better over the over years and you know again there's different ways of training there'll be people that are training differently that are beating me but I'm a strong believer that the way I'm training will try and will keep me as, as injury free as I can over a long period of time and, and allow me to build consistently and steadily mm -hmm. um and you know, time will tell whether that works, but it's worked for me so far, and it's a personal thing. You know, everyone's got their own ways and uh, ways of doing things, and and I, mean, I believe in this, and this is what I'm going to stick with. Yeah, and and I, I think I think it's really good because one of the things I again was interested to to ask you about, and you you've pretty much answered it, is um, sometimes when people get very focused on times, it can become kind of like overwhelming and become so competitive mm. that you aren't looking after yourself anymore yeah and, yeah. and it, when again uh, that's that aspect's very interesting because from everything you've described and see you've you've kind of, you've already really answered this because you, you've talked about all the things you do that looks after you yeah yeah <laughs> and uh so so yeah i mean i guess just more on the on the mental side um it sounds like um this is very healthy mentally the way you're going about it. Would you agree with that? I would, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm I've always had a, a pretty strong mind, really. You know, um, again, what happened to me in my personal life wasn't great last year, but um, 
I've always been able to look on the bright side. Um, you know, I've got a lovely daughter, nice family. Um, and I enjoy running. I enjoy my time out there, whether I'm talking to people, listening to a podcast, music, or an audio book or whatever. And it's, yeah, it's healthy. It's, you know, it, it's, it's good social life through running. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I see it all as healthy. And, you know, the times aren't, aren't everything. I, I do like to challenge myself and I always like to, to sort of beat, you know, I always wanted to get a sub 25, sub 40, 10, sub 130 half. But they were just personal little challenges to me, and, um, and I, you know, I did them eventually, and, and you know, I set myself another challenge. Now I want to get a three ten marathon, a sub three marathon, whatever. Um, and as long as you know they, they don't become everything in your life, and they're just sort of nice, happy challenges that you you know you want to try and get, not that you have to get. Then then I think it keeps it all in check, really. Um, so yeah, I think it, I think it's it's all. It's all where it needs to be. Yeah, no, it, it certainly sounds that way to me. I'm, I'm, I'm not somebody who would judge. I, I, I tend to um, not say something <laughs> if I think something negative about what somebody's telling me. Yeah, but, no. Uh, but no, it's, uh, it's it certainly, I, it certainly sounds like you, you've got a, a really good handle on on things where you're going, going about it in a way that works for you and is is sort of going about it intelligently which is why I was particularly interested to, to share your story because yeah. um, and, uh, I'm sure I'll have mentioned to you when I started running and started getting faster I came to that sort of decision point do I want to keep going faster or do I want to go longer and I decided to, to go longer yeah that's just it was just on balance it interested me a bit more um, and so it was just really interesting meeting somebody who'd made the other decision and you know, <laughs> comparing I think notes. I think distance scared me, so I think I think, <laughs> I, I, think I, I knew I could put myself through pain for five or ten k, and even maybe a half marathon now. But marathons always scared me. Long runs always scared me. Um, and again, through this training in the last eight months, they, they scare me a lot less now. Um, but yeah, I think I, st- I stuck to what I knew initially. Um, and, and yeah, and so I don't know whether an ultra would ever be for me. I mean, what, yeah, what it, you it, it, me. <laughs> it's just interesting the way you've said it, actually, because I hadn't quite thought of it like that. In that, um, I knew that, um, sort of like if I ran fast, sort of kind of it's more sort of acute pain would come on. And if I ran slow for a long way, I kind of thought, well, I, I, the better I get, the longer it is before it starts hurting. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll go through that pain when I have to, but it's almost like I'm putting off the pain for longer and longer as, yeah. as, as I get into into longer distance. So it's kind of like the it's just almost pain management. Um, but then what, once you get into it, um, either way, is, um, you know, once you get into the running it at pace, you, you learn about the the strength work and things that can yeah. look after you. It doesn't have to be painful. Um, to, to get the best results you're going to get, we all put ourselves through pain in, yeah. in, in the races, whether, whether it's short, sharp pain or, or long, drawn out. <laughs> and I, and, you know, <laughs> I think there's been times when I've run 5Ks and 10Ks and given absolutely everything and fallen over the line and been sick everywhere and stuff. And I think I think whatever race you do, if you give it absolutely everything, they're all as hard as each other, really, yeah. um, in yeah, different right. ways. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know you can run long slow or hard fast so short fast or whatever and they've all got different aspects of pain in there haven't they but yeah uh, definitely I, I did a it was a half marathon I did um, I think last back end of September early October and because it's like yeah it's half marathon distance so I'm just going to run as fast as I can for the whole thing mm. and that was really really hard work yeah just, yeah uh, you know just mentally to keep pushing yourself on the pace all the time um and then, you know, co- compared to to running a really long way, it just gets to be uh, the the challenge of, well, you know, can I keep going? Yeah. Um, can I can I stay focused enough for like thirty six, thirty seven hours where I'm not wasting time at a checkpoint and things like yeah. that? And yeah, I'm I'm not quite there yet. The the later checkpoint, I did waste some time. Right. The earlier checkpoint, I was pretty good. I was pretty happy with it. But uh, yeah, it's you know, like you say, it's 
you, you kind of decide what interests you, don't you? Yeah. And, uh, what, what's what's going to motivate you? What, what's that end goal you're thinking of when you are pushing yourself out in the cold, rainy nights or early mornings? And <laughs> I was watching the back of the marathons documentary on Netflix the other day. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Yeah. But the fact that you've got to come back to the start line and go out on different on, on continuous loops of pretty much the same course and it's that hard out. That, that I mean that must be mentally. Yeah, I've, I, I've done two races that. Uh, other than there's a few local park runs that are two or three loops, isn't there? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, other than that, I've, I've the, the half marathon I did was kind of off from the start up a hill, loop round, do twice round the loop and then back down. Right. Um, and then the the Huddersfield marathon I did last year, it was two loops of the half. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 a hilly one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can imagine. So, but yeah, I. I don't really like loops. <laughs> well, it's, yeah. it's hard get going out again. Yeah. In fact, I did the White Rose Ultra um, this year, oh, sorry, um, November. I did two loops of the 31 miles. <coughs> right. That, that was hard going out for yeah. the second loop. <laughs> <Can't> imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't like loops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I actually, um, I really like the races where it's like a long continuous line where you're not starting and finishing in the yeah. same place feels like you're going somewhere yeah yeah <laughs> or out and back sometimes when you turn turn back that can that can psychologically help you like a, a long canal ones where you just think i oh, was 10 miles that way 10 miles back you you feel like you're you're winning on the way back you, you know you're, you're going back to where you need to be yeah yeah as long as you yeah, i find it's useful to, to work out because Although you always think canals are flat because they're alongside the water, of course there's locks there for a reason because they're, yeah, going, exactly, up, they're yeah. going uphill. So if you run out on the uphill and run back on the downhill, I find it's best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's surprising a lot of the roads in Halifax. Uh, I work on Wakefield Road, which is quite a long flat road, and um, oh, it's quite a long flat road when you're driving in a car. But actually, when you're running one way, is, it's not significantly uphill, but it is it is uphill one way and downhill the other, and uh, you don't know it's a lot of these things in cars. You, <laughs> no. you certainly do when you're running them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and no, I've, uh, I've got a pretty good mental map of every hill and bump around here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so just just before we finish then, Gav, um, the, there's always people looking towards marathon training. And like I said, I've, I've been very impressed with how you've gone about yours. Um, as, as we've said, you, you're, not a, you're not an expert, neither am I. We're sharing our experiences here. But um, for somebody who's thinking about you know, maybe they've been inspired by Manchester, or they're gonna. People are soon gonna be watching London Marathon and get inspired by that, and then they're gonna think, "Oh, yeah, I'm gonna do a marathon back end of the year or next year." What would your advice be about where where to start? I think um, there's so much set advice that says, "Oh, you start your marathon training in January for a spring marathon, and, and this is what you should do." And I, th I just think that. The more you can run, you know, it, it depends where people are in their journeys and where they're starting off. But it, say you don't run at all, I think the key is just to to build up to run as many miles as you can in a week. And for some people, that might be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, whatever. Um, doing speed sessions will help and it will make you a faster runner. But if, if you're just starting off, it's not complicated. Just, just run. Just, you know, don't just. You're better off running six miles slow than three miles fast um, if you're training for a marathon. So just just slowly get those miles in and and build up over over time. Um, if you're not a member of a club, join a club and try and get some structured st structured training in. Um, and and do some stuff fast, some stuff slow. Um, if you can get a, you know if you can want and you want to get a coach you know that's that's helped me massively I've, I've really enjoyed it but you know again that's not for everyone um but but structure your week think about your week um you know even if you're just looking at a plan on the internet there's a lot of good books out there um surprisingly i found nel mcandrew's book she's you know she's a very good runner in her own right and there's a lot of there's a lot of, sort of bump in there should we call it you know stuff that i wasn't interested in but she, she does a few good really good chapters about how she got to be a sub three hour marathon runner mm -hmm. um and a few about how she started running etc and and it's really well written and the plan she stuck to um again was very similar to mine where she got herself up to doing 60 or 70 miles a week you know a lot of it slow and ses key sessions etc so um so you know 
do some reading you know there's lots of plans out there on the internet etc um and 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 plan you know it, some people just want to finish a marathon some people want to work as hard as they can and and then get a really good time you know some might be sort of looking for sub threes etc but but planning and preparation um and, and approach has always got to work i think you know yeah. um and i said the same with every race really even 5k's and 10k's and halves people just seem to have plans for marathons but if you have a plan for a half or a plan for a 10k the more you put in physically mentally and 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 preparing the more you'll get out and and it's all about how much you want to commit to it i think and um you know people just want to have fun and finish a marathon brilliant if people want to try and get the absolute best out of their body and then you do have to work harder and and, and people can put the you know you, again that's the one thing i did I, I, <laughs> one positive from sort of splitting up my wife was that obviously i have my daughter quite a bit but i had more free time so one positive I could take from it was, well, I'm going to use this free time, you know, before I you know, hopefully get together with someone else some, <laughs> at some stage. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of all this free time I have on my hands and and, and put that into my running. Um, so, you, you know, I guess you've got to look at what you can sacrifice per week and, and look at when you can run and, and how much you can run and, um, and then base your, your training around that. Yeah. I think that's uh, all really sound advice and... I think the one other thing that we mentioned when we were chatting beforehand was, um, and I think it ties in with having written plans, is, is the reflection on how it went yeah. afterwards. Yeah, yeah. As well, because you, you mentioned you you like to write it down. Yeah, well, I, I always thought, you know, every marathon I've done, I've been scared before, and I felt relieved and and more confident after, and it, and the same with every race really. And I, I always thought it'd be great to bottle how you feel immediately after the race so you could open that bottle up at another time and remind yourself that you know actually i think such, i think i read a quote from ali dixon who's a, a gb marathon runner and she said uh, respect the marathon but don't be scared of it mm-hmm. and that's how i felt afterwards and and so after this marathon the day after at work i i wrote down um i wrote down all my feelings and everything i'd learned from my training and it was almost like a little story I'd wrote for myself, just a couple of pieces of A4, so that next year when I start my marathon training plan again, I've got it all there and I can remind myself what worked and what didn't work and, and how I felt at the end. And hopefully I'll be able to look at it again and not be as scared about the actual race. And um, I think it's just about moving on consistently. You know, you, things are going to go right and wrong, but. Um, if you learn from everything and get a little bit better every time, then I uh, think you're doing all right. Yeah, yeah. No, I th- again, think it's, it's it's really good because, as you say, by by reflecting on it, you you get the most learning you can out of it, uh, and th- that that's the thing. Because again, you know, where we're talking about training runs, or you might use like a, a half marathon as a as training for a marathon. If you want to get the most out of your half, you need to do your race plan, your reflection. Because that's kind of that's practicing for doing it yeah, in, exactly. in the full one. Yeah, so, yeah. And I, I completely agree with you. The, the more of these things you do, the, the the more, especially the more you write down, the the faster you'll learn from it. Yeah. And you know, I say that, and I'm, I don't write down as much as I'd like to. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm the same. Yeah, yeah that, that. but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's one of, one of the reasons why I started doing this podcast is because now I get to talk and share and learn and <laughs> yeah yeah and, and you know everything so. i've said tonight that's it's all personal to me and everyone's different and i enjoyed it and that's what works for me and and you know people can laugh take your advice on do what they want really but that that's you know that's what i wanted to do and and it, you know it got me a three and a half minute half marathon pb and a 11 minute marathon pb so yeah i'm happy <laughs> yeah no, that's <laughs> So it sounds really good to me. Um, and do you want to share your Instagram handle? Um, yeah, I'm at, at Gav, at Gav going for sub three on Instagram. Yeah, at Gav going for sub three. Yeah, and I, I'll I'll put that on because um, I'm on Instagram now, which okay. I know you've I, 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 you've liked some of my pictures. Yeah, so yeah, you should, yeah. should know it's on there. And yeah, I, I, I use the uh, running your stories handle. Okay. Um, and we'll I'll I'll put a 
a post on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, yeah, everywhere I can when the when the podcasts are ready to come out. Well, on, on Instagram, I did a, like I say a photo diary of every day of my training, um, so that's on there. I'm just having a little break from that now, and I, I don't know whether I'll continue doing that or not. But yeah. um, but it, 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 everything I did from sort of August to last Sunday is on there, and it's one day per you know one picture per day, and and, and a little note of the session or run or whatever I did and what pace I did. And yeah, that kind no, of thing. it's it, it, it's only recently I've gone onto onto Instagram. I, I've been having a look at it, and it, it looks interesting. Um, for then, for running your stories, I've been taking a slightly different slant in that. What, it, what one of the things I really enjoy about my running is being outside every day, mm. and I, I slightly cheat in that some of the pictures I take, I'm walking, not running. Yeah, because I, I walk every day as well as run every day because that's part of my ultra long distance strategy. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> um, and so I take a picture outside every day and um, put it on Instagram. It's only been uh, probably only for a few weeks now, but. So it's surprising how how quickly the followers build up. Yeah, well, mine was never. It was never from a narcissistic point of view. I wanted to make myself accountable, so that's why there's not loads of pictures of me yes. in my face. I try to do scenery on my trainers or silly pictures or whatever. But I just wanted to put my challenge out there and challenge myself. And you know, again, it was part of it was just getting over what happened to me and and, and moving on. And it was just um, just something I wanted to do. Um, yeah. And people can follow you or look at it or not they don't have to so uh, yeah. but you know it's something that I've got now I've got my journey for that 2019 marathon so yeah. well, that's that's really good so thanks very much Gav for, thanks for having me for coming along and no sharing problem. your story no it's problem it's been a been a pleasure yeah I mean, if I break through it sub three next year we'll do it again <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely do it again yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. thank thanks. you thanks Thank you for listening to Running Your Stories. Please subscribe, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whichever you prefer. All three is even better. Um, we're on Podbean, and we're on iTunes, we're on Google Podcasts, we're on YouTube. Um, subscribe and rate us if you wish. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We'll be back again soon. Any last messages, William, to our listeners here? No, no more messages from William. What do you think? Should people run fast or should they run slow? They should, they, they should run fast. Right, so eight-year-old William says you should run fast. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>